Ooh, fancy. So, yeah, I, I started playing with some RFID stuff and now spent a larger chunk of money than I ever intended to spend on this stuff, but it's been worth it so far. It's fun. And just the the getting to be the, the, the little geek nerd now about all the fun stuff. Um, for this meeting specifically, I bought a, oh, am I, yeah, there's a camera. I bought a, a whole other kit because I wanted to walk through a lot of the stuff that really bought me for a while that I eventually figured out and was like, oh, that wasn't that hard if I just would have known. Um, that tends to be sort of my niche in presentations is this is covering the hard stuff made easy. Um, however, the hard stuff that I still can't figure out, I'm not going to cover a whole lot because, well, I suck at it, uh, which is why, as you'll see on the title, mostly the 125 kilohertz gear, not as much as 13.56, which we'll get into a little bit later. Uh, but yeah, that's sort of a synopsis. So as part of the live demo, we'll go through setting up the, the device that I got. We've got some fancy little detector cards and some other fun toys. Um, not sure how much of this will translate over the camera to remote. Uh, but hey, we'll do what we can, and the people in the room can ooh and ah and laugh at it all they want. Well, when it comes time for you to actually be demoing stuff, I can actually flop uh, which screen is spotlighted uh, so that you can see the, the webcam as well here. I'm not following, but that's okay. Anyway, it's good. <laughs> um, so, some terminology to get started uh, RFID, radio frequency identification, um, uses magnetic coupling which is also known as inductive coupling, not just straight RF energy. So this is, while it's from a physics standpoint, the crap travels through the air very similarly to a traditional radio that you get in your car. The way that it actually communicates is extremely different from that or from Wi-Fi or from any other RF based technology because it's actually it's a lot more the way that a transformer works and that a transformer changes voltages is that it needs to be in much closer proximity in order to get that that coupling effect uh, it still follows inverse square law but it's it's different I don't fully understand the physics started to read some papers on it that's about the limit of my knowledge at this time uh, t5577 uh, also sometimes t55xx for the various variations. It's a microchip or chips from Atmel that can emulate various different modes of the lower frequency stuff, the, the 125 kilohertz. Um, the EM4100 and the HID formats are some popular ones that uh, I've come across, played with, et cetera. Um, and yeah, so sometimes T55, I mentioned that refers to the family. Low frequency and high frequency. Um, 125 or 134.2 kilohertz are considered low frequency. I think I've come across some 134.2 kilohertz stuff, but I haven't been able to confirm it because I don't have like an actual uh, RF spectrum analyzer or anything. Um, and then the 13.56 megahertz is all the high frequency. It's your uh, better RFID, your little bit more secure stuff. It's your MyFair cards. It's your uh, mobile pay. It's all that fun stuff. Uh, it's also a pain in the butt to deal with, which is part of why it's more secure because you can actually do encryption and whatnot yada yada um come across a fair bit of that stuff too uh in my findings but again it's a lot more difficult to play with and uh i've also been kind of nervous you know with for example cards that i need to fiddle with them and not wanting to brick them just in case um which can happen even if the card says it's not writable and we'll get into that in a little while um, low frequency stuff is almost always, uh, from what I've seen, from what I've read, uh, Wigan or HID or the EM 4100-ish EM stuff format. Uh, but there are a lot of variations uh, on the EM stuff and on the, the HID side of stuff. And HID is actually a company, but it's sort of used generically. Wigan was the name of some guy that started the protocol and standard for cards and whatnot, yada, yada. It covers the electrical standards for the readers themselves. It covers the, the data transport format and how like, it's something goofy like, if one's high and the other's low, it's a zero. And if they're both high or both low, it's a one. It's kind of like an X word if I remember right. Um, that was the guy's name and it's kind of become a standard. It used to be back in like the magnetic, not magnetic stripe, but magnetic tick marks, if I was reading it right. And basically if you had a tick mark on both things versus just a tick mark was shifted or whatever, that was kind of your, it almost looks like the barcodes that you see at the bottom of postal mail. 
Um, probably for similar reasons. Anyhow, Proxmark is an open source RFID platform. Um, open sources, and you can go online and find source code and stuff. I think their circuit diagrams are open source. I'm not sure. I don't care because I'm not sending off my own circuit board to be fabbed. I'm buying one that some random seller on Amazon is giving for me. Also, the, the newest Proxmark is the Proxmark 3 RDV4. And the RDV2 had a knockoff called the Proxmark 3 Easy that was actually an official Proxmark thing for a while. And that's what both of my Proxmarks are, is the Proxmark 3 Easy. A very similar project is the Chameleon Mini. They kind of want to spin up their own thing. They did some cool stuff. There's actually a really cool product that came out of them that I'll, I'll show here in a bit. Uh, credit to a few different things. And Dangerous Things is the name of a, a website, forum, vendor, yada, yada, yada. Uh, tons, oh, I, there's a typo there. Tons of info, not into. Tons of info. Um, one of the big things that they do is various implants. So if you're one of those people that wants a chip implant in your hand to open doors that way, They've got pretty much everything you need to get started except the uh, surgeons themselves. Uh, but they, I believe they even have lists of like surgeons that come recommended by them that will do the implants for you and full kits with sterilizing wipes and everything else. Um, several people at SecDSM helped me get unstuck at various points in my journey, not just as part of this presentation, but even before that. HID, I don't know what it stands for. I don't believe it's human interface device in this context, but uh, they're a company. They have tons of PDFs on this stuff, apparently the low frequency stuff and how the weekend protocol works and the various bit lengths that you can have and yada, yada, yada. Also, KC is a, they brand themselves as reinventing physical security. Their articles are great. They tell you what you can and can't do. They go way deeper dive than a lot of blog articles go. I've loved reading their stuff and their website design doesn't suck either. So that's helpful. Um, Takeaways first, demo later. Like I say, I like to, to help things that have been a struggle for me. This top command here can unbrick uh, one of the T55 whatever chips uh, that have been bricked in some cases. Uh, I had one that I bricked and this command brought it back to life. Uh, so if you're gonna be doing this, take a screenshot of this or get the link at the end of the presentation if you want. Um, some other key commands are LF and HF for low frequency or high frequency search. That's the Proxmark sort of catch all for let's see what's out there. Um, then you've got your EM 410X uh, and then reader or watch, depending on what you're looking to do. Watch gives just a continuous, any tags that come by, it'll just print them out to the screen. Uh, reader just does one tag. Same thing with the LFHID. Then you've got your cloning commands. And as you can see, I've included a, a tag number of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Because if anyone's using that in the world, I'm sorry, you should just take that one out of your rotation. Um, and then the raw command for that too, which will make a little bit more sense here in a few minutes. Um, so let's, oh, hello, hello. Okay, low end, surprisingly prevalent. Uh, it's 26 bits, but the ends are parity. So it's really 24 bits of data. And effectively one byte is your facility code and the other two bytes are the card number. And typically the way that this works, if you order just, just you know, random company ordering these 24 bit Wigan low frequency cards is they just say, hey, you know, I've got, I, I, I need some cards and they'll just ship it out and it'll be a box and on the box is the facility code. And then on the card itself is the card number. So if you have both of those pieces of data, you've got the full card number. You don't ever need the actual card itself. If you have a picture of the card with the card number and you've got a picture of the box or whatever, however you want to do it. Or if you, uh, you know, get a hold of one of these cards and you can scan it and read its card number, well, now you know the facility code of whatever else came in that box, most likely. Um, if you're big enough to have contacts, I'm, I, as I understand it, you can have custom orders and say, hey, we want to use this facility code for this batch of cards and they'll do it for you. Um, but yeah, that's sort of the basic gist of it. And you can see I've screenshotted an online calculator. If you Google for a weekend calculator, this will probably be one of your first five results. So, uh, oh, and by the way, then this presentation and the link, I'll have a link at the end to look at the presentation. Go to the speaker notes. I've put gobs and gobs of URLs there for all the various stuff referenced and semi-relevant to the slides. Um, 
And a note on lower security, like I mentioned, low frequency stuff is generally considered lower security. There's no encryption. It's just the straight read of the data there. And the high frequency stuff can do encryption and all sorts of fun little stuff. But let's think about how insecure this low frequency stuff is for a minute. 16 million, 770, you know, 16.78 million combinations. That's still a lot. Uh, most physical key locks don't come anywhere near to that. I've seen 30,000 thrown around as a common number. Uh, Madoko on one of their articles was talking about, you know, if you really want security, you should increase your biddings to 64,000. Well, this is 16 million. Um, and that's the like the bare minimum that you can get. That's that's not any of the higher bit lengths. That's not with encryption. That's not any. Can you look at that though? What? Well, good one for that, I'm not finding it. M E D O C O. That's right. Medico. And did I spell it wrong? I thought it was Medico. They, they do uh, high security keys and locks, right? Yeah. Yeah. Is that the same company? M E. Let me see. Ah, uh, it's M E D E C O. Okay, there's another typo. M E D E C O. Here, let's let's fix those two typos real quick. Otherwise, I'm going to forget. That's going to drive me nuts too. Okay, if we're pausing, I also have <laughs> another question comment. Um, are you on? Uh, uh, um, I don't know what it's called on your box, but red, yeah, blue filter mode already. Oh yeah, I probably uh, am. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure I am. I can I can disable that. Give me just a second here. No, it's soothing. Soothing. All right. Well, then I won't disable it. That's all right. If you want to see the slides oh, and all their great, you got it on yours. It's like doubled, isn't it? Oh. If you, uh, well, it's hey, if you, soothing, right? If right. you, I mean, it's recording in order. <laughs> that's all right. If you want to see it in all its high def gray glory instead of gray orange, you can go download the presentation when we're done. This will just be an artifact of the uh, of the way it happened. <laughs> Um, but yes, that's that's a good question. And this one does not have it. This one does. So yeah. Anyhow, um, also different attack vectors. So Medeco, or however it's pronounced, I don't know how to pronounce it. Go ask a locksmith. Um, they're well known for making like not necessarily the highest security locks, but up there and being like if you want a high security lock and you just want to go out and buy something that works with commercial doors, you go with Medoka because you know it's going to work and you know it's going to be high security. They're pick resistant, they're drill resistant, they're all sorts of whatever. Um, it's Medico, like the I believe. Locks, if you will. Medico, okay. See, this is, this is the problem with I, only ever really reading something and only hearing it a couple times I, and then forgetting. I absolutely understand. I, uh, I've been up to the, <laughs> the lock picks group uh, a couple of years ago. Nice. Yeah, I've, I've heard them say it a few times. So, <laughs> Medico. That's cool. Um, there are different attack vectors though. So they both have attack vectors, both physical locks and RFID stuff. Also keep in mind, RFID is usually supplemental. It's not usually in place of. So usually these doors will have both type of attacks that will work against them as the key-based stuff and the RFID stuff. It's not always the case, especially if you get maglock doors. Those are awesome. I've heard lots of fun stories. I haven't had a chance to do those fun stories because I wasn't allowed to with the owners of the hardware. Um, but yeah, like I had the privilege of working with one that was rated at 1,200 pounds of force. So at that point, you're probably going to rip apart the door frame rather than, you know, popping the magnet. Um, no so longer a non-destructive attack. Exactly. So, um, and keys have, you know, impressioning, picking, picture, you can take a picture with your smartphone and poof, now you can go make a key if you know what you're doing. RFID, to forces, or RFID devices have brute force simulating and cloning. If you have a, a Proxmark or a reader in a backpack and you, you know, messenger bag bump up against someone, boom, now you got their card number. If it's one of these, you know, 125 kilohertz, lower frequency, not really secure things. Um, to their credit though, with the Wigan protocol or serial, a lot of these card readers also use serial or have the option to. Um, the intelligence is not at the reader. So even if you rip the reader off the wall and connect to it directly with a computer or a bus pirate or something, that doesn't really gain you anything because all that reader's doing is handing a code over to the uh, the door controller and the door controller is then saying, you know, pop the lock or don't pop the lock. Um, also, 
I haven't found a manufacturer of you know commercial grade door hardware that does not have the ability to rate bar. And most of them have it enabled by default. So if you, you know, first of all, you've got the data transmission, right? It's only a handful of bits a second. I want to say it's something equivalent to around 2,400 Bob, which isn't a lot. It's, it's a lot when you consider you only need to transfer 26 bits, but it's also not a lot. And a lot of, you know, stuff you can set it, say, after five bad reads, you know, lock it out for a minute. You know, let's not let them in because they're trying to brute force us. Uh, so think fail to ban for door hardware. Also, keys, physical keys have no way that I know of to mass revoke in case of emergency or, you know, terminations, firings, that sort of thing. So if you all of a sudden say, you know, I need these 30 people to not be able to access these 12 doors, well, you better call a locksmith and have them work fast. Whereas with, you know, a, a digital system like, like the doorstep, you can just go in to wherever the thing is and say, boop, bye. Um, so yes, maybe low security. I still feel like at the end of the day, it's not terrible security. And it's in a lot of ways, I think better than key-based security. As long as you're not just throwing the world's cheapest lock on it and now your key is the weak point, yada, yada. Anyhow, um, iron, less common, unfortunately. And there are all sorts of charts and statistics about this. My experience is so limited that regardless of what I've seen, it plays no bearing in the real world as far as how many of each type of thing I've seen and all that. But um, I want to say that the, the most recent report was like a 2019 or 2020 report. It was about two thirds, one third. About two thirds of companies were implementing the lower frequency stuff, and about a third were implementing the higher frequency. So it's and it's been growing. Like the pie chart's been shifting. So we're getting there. Still got a ways to go. If you want my opinion. If you are implementing a brand new system that has no legacy, anything to it, do not implement the low frequency stuff. Only implement the high frequency stuff. The cost difference is not enough to make a justification for the lower frequency. If you are trying to be backwards compatible with anything, it gets a lot more complicated. If you've already got a 125 kilohertz system and you're wondering if you should upgrade it, it depends on your threat model, really. Like I, I can't make that call for you. It's something to consider, but Again, 16 some million combinations and rate limit and all that, you know, and then considering that a brick can probably do just as much damage, um, it would just maybe be a little bit easier to detect. Although granted, if you have good logging, you can, you know, see the brute force temps and all that too. So anyhow, um, the, the high frequency stuff supports encryption. Basically it does a whole little handshake, which is also why uh, the cards are, even if you, have the the key a lot of these you know go figure they use a default key they use one of like five common default keys so you know what good does it do if you're to encrypt it if you're just gonna have a default key then right well you still usually have to like hold your card in place for it to read if you've ever used a mobile payment you know that sometimes that can be a little bit finicky it's not like you know just bump it up against it and it works and have to hold it there wait for it to do its thing because it's doing a handshake right it's going back and forth and it's asking and sure it's faster but it's still not fast per se it's not in the gigahertz it's not wi-fi so yeah and then they've got you know they had to balance you know okay well we can support you know like a kilobyte i think it is the data back and forth in the ads so anyhow it's it's better takes longer ish you have to hold it in place so it's a little bit harder to clone because of all that stuff too but it is still possible to clone it's not impossible um the highest security would be, and the standards are always changing, but get the highest supported, like I believe it's MyFair or MeFair or whatever, uh, and ISO standard stuff so that you're not, you know, vendor locked in and create your own encryption key uh, and have whatever vendor you're going with implement that because that's going to be currently basically the highest standard in security as far as this stuff goes. Uh, dual frequency readers on the topic of retrofitting and whatnot. They can be great if you are looking to switch over. Uh, you can install these dual frequency in place. And I actually have some dual frequency cards with me as well. I do not have any proper readers because they are expensive. Uh, the cards are cheap, only about a dollar a piece. Um, but yeah, so if you wanted to switch over and we're trying to do it in phases to not take the hit all at once, you can install dual frequency readers and it can read the low frequency cards and high frequency cards. And you can program it on the back end however you do that. 
Um, and you can see these with an RF detection card. You'll know right away if it's a dual frequency reader reading both frequencies or attempting to. So I'll show you that here in a while. Um, all right, double time. Might be a total flop. This is the Proxmark 3 Easy, not the RDV4 from Amazon. Um, these likely come with either outdated or some random training firmware on them. Uh, so the, the main steps to get this set up are clone in the repo. Everyone uses the Iceman repo, which is now the RFID Research Group repo. Um, compile the software, update the firmware on it. Might mess it up. We'll see. That's why I've got a second one with me. Um, or TFM if it goes wrong, and then we'll have some fun. Uh, not covered is the computer prep before cloning it. You'll need the dependencies for building it. You need to disable modem manager so it doesn't break your device. Yeah, there are a few other things. It's all covered on uh, the GitHub repo there. So let's uh, let's give this a shot and see what we got. So we'll hop on over to RFID Research Group Proxmark 3. You also still see my screen, I think. Nope, it's, it's catching up. up, catching up. All right. If you hear me say something, just know you'll probably see it here in a couple minutes. I think I actually wanted to link below it, but that's okay. We'll get there. Yeah, here we are. Perhaps mark three. There are a couple gotchas along the way. How am I doing on time? Isn't that funny? At 744, uh, I mean, as long as I want to go, there is a point that will cut you off, but we're not at that point. Okay, it'll take a little bit. If this, if this ends up taking too long, I'll just switch over to the pre compiled version I have. But hey, what's what's a good demo, or what's what's a talk without a good demo, you know? Um, all right, so I'm going to jump right to the I've already done this important notes on Moto Manager, so I think I can jump straight to the uh clone the repo and all that fun stuff. And I've already done all that. I've already got the permission. I just need to go to, ooh, I need to clone it though. I do need to clone it. So we're gonna copy and paste this guy into the terminal because everyone knows that copying and pasting code from the internet is always a good thing to do. Um, you can see I've got my, well, you can't see because I didn't ls at first, but this was an empty directory. I made it just for this talk. An adjacent directory to this without the CIA log at the end has my already existing uh, Proxmark stuff. And this was running on like a second or third gen i3 laptop processor being double tunneled over SSH. And yeah, but I think it'll still be quick enough that it won't really matter. As you can see, it's already downloaded. That's good. We move to the compiling instructions. Now, if you're like me in a cheapskate, because the Proxmark RDV4. Proxmark 3 RDV4 is like $290 piece of gear. It's amazing. It's wonderful. I want one. I don't want one enough to spend the money on it. Um, so, yeah, let's see. Do, 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 do. We've already done all that, I think. Let me just double check. CD Proxmark 3, get pull. Proxmark 3. Already up to date. Yep. So then we'll paste in this guy. No, not there. It's right here. There we go. And then there is a, oh, I already messed something up. Because we need to go under the advanced compilation parameters here. Because by default, it compiles for the RDV4, which does not work on this device. And I should probably get this device out too if we're going to be attempting to do something with it. This will be the first time that I've actually plugged it into a computer. So if it doesn't work, well, that's why I've got the other one. I'm still within my Amazon return period. So <laughs> I made sure of that before, uh, before deciding I was going to do it this way. And it's got two ports on it. For any of you that are, are curious, it's got one on the side and one on the end. Use the one on the end. I don't fully know what the one on the side is for. It's not really well documented. I believe it's for use in standalone mode. But I can't say that with 100% confidence either. Um, so we are going to see, here we are, we need to set our platform to PM3 generic. So I need to remember how to run a compile command using 
the platform thing. I believe I just throw it into the make command. Is that right? See, this is part of the learning thing right here. I believe it's I believe it's right here. Make I believe it's the what does make clean do? Make clean just uh, deletes all of the uh, yeah art, artifacts. Come back here. Did you actually? Okay, yep. I copied and pasted the right thing. That's good. Okay, so now we want. And make J with the thing at the, at the end. Do, 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 do. You can tell I don't compile software very often. So if I can figure this out, then great, I'm asking for help now. But obviously, I've done it once, otherwise, I wouldn't <laughs> know all this. Um, but yeah, so make, make a note self. You want to you wanna put that if you're make command, if you're like me and you, you need some hand holding on this sort of thing. Um, but that's really the only advanced option we're going to need. So let's close that tab. And then we're not going to pseudo make install. We're just going to run the thing. Because I'm just running it straight out of the directory. So all the stuff I'm going to do, all the commands here, I'm going to be prefixing with a dot slash to get it to run. Um, because that's how it's set up. So here it goes. And it's compiling and compiling. And this is the part where you look at the XKCD comics and you know why programmers have a lot of free time because it's compiling. If it doesn't complete real soon, I'll go ahead and kill it and we'll switch over to the other one, but I'm hoping it'll work. And then I'll have two function and prox marks by the end of this talk. Also, I looked, I could not find a way to dump the firmware from this thing using the tools provided here. Uh, I looked at like some of the source code and the scripts and all that, and as best I can tell, it is not designed to dump firmware. It is only designed to update it. So here goes something. PM3 flash all. We didn't try to create or appear and then bootloader, press and release the button only to abort. So we're not gonna touch the thing. And Something did not work. Bootloader is not understood. So I believe that I need to bootloader PM3. Still being recorded, right? Yeah. See, this This is the fun part. You can go back and look, and you can see what's what's not working right. Press and release the button only to abort. I believe at one point on the other one, I had to press and release the button to get it to enter a programming mode. So we'll see if that. Uh, well, hey, it says all done. Okay. All right. Well, let's see if we can flash all now. I was waiting for it to appear, which means I'm going to unplug and replug, and we'll see what happens. I'm just not too happy about that, is it? Where's the button on this guy anyway? There it is. Well, oh, 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 okay, that looked a lot happier. Okay, so what I did there is I pressed and held the button as I plugged in the cable. And then I was just slightly more patient than I had been before. And that appears that it may be happy. Still waiting for Proxmark to appear. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna reboot the Proxmark again and try and be patient. Let's sit for a little bit. There should be a way to do this too. With if you look at um, dev tty USB, and you can see that it's not there yet. Let's see what we got. This USB ain't happy.
Hey, there we are, right? No, maybe not. I can't tell if that's more devices or not. All right, I'll try this one more time. That's my up here on that working. There we go. This is what you get when you live demo, I guess. Anticlimactic. Nope. Tell you what, if I get that one working again, uh, later at home, I'll post in the Slack about how I got it working. For now, I'll go ahead and pull out the, oh, oh, oh. Threaten it with obsolescence and it starts to work. Ah, go figure. Just like, you know, saying, oh, I guess we're going to have to get a new printer, you know, and oh, hey, look, there comes the document I printed an hour ago. All right. So now this Proxmark is now, my goodness, that LED is bright. That is a lot brighter than the one that on my other one, as far as I remember. To be uh, fair, you compiled and flashed firmware in a live demo. So uh, hats off to you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Um, so let's see, uh, and I did it all over Wi-Fi and a double SSH tunnel at that, so. Um, Wall screen sharing. <laughs> Wall screen sharing from a Chromebook. That is one of the most awesome ASCII art I've seen in a while. Yeah, and they have some really nice color coding and stuff too. So now we're into the easy part, right? Like, boom, there it is. I'm at my, I'm at my Proxmox terminal. They've got this fancy little blah 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 i always like seeing that at the start that's how you know it actually connected and it's talking to the device and yeah it's going to be fun so now let's have some fun let's see where i, I completely lost where i was out of my presentation let's back hop back over here let's go full screen with this again and i'll just alt tab between uh between that uh terminal window and this now so em 4100 demo so this device here that i have is uh marketed as a firearms or valuable safe I would not trust it with either of those because it's got a real crappy lock. It was even like 50 bucks and whatnot, but I wanted to play with it. So I got it and it comes in useful. I do have a couple of small things that I'll use it for from time to time, but it doesn't see a lot of use because, well, it's, it's not the greatest security. As you can see, it's got a key backup, which is also probably a weak point, uh, empty currently. But one of the nice things is it came with these little doohickeys that you can program. You can also wipe them. After this demo, since everyone will see the key, I'm gonna go home and wipe the memory of it. But if you hold it over the thing, it has a little RFID and it pops the hatch, which is fun. One of the things that you can do if you're not sure what this does, you can use this RFID detector card. This one's from Dangerous Things. It's slightly flexible. I don't know how flexible, I'm not gonna push my luck. And put it over it and you can see nothing happens. This is kind of a known issue. I started chatting them up in their YouTube channel. These cards are not super great at the low frequency stuff. The antenna leaves a little bit to be desired. So the makers of the Chameleon Mini that I mentioned, sort of a Proxmark competitor, have this little guy. Now this little guy, I don't know how well this will translate over video, but to the people of Verson, you can see there's a little blip, blip, blip of a red light. So that tells us two things. One, because it's a red light, and this uses the red LED for low frequency, that tells us it's a low frequency. Uh, signal and it tells us that it's because it's a battery operated device, it's duty cycle. Something, yeah, um, on behalf of the people that are not, that are not in this room. Uh -huh. um, move slower with your hand motions in front of the camera. Okay, <laughs> so it uh, it may not pick up, but it is doing a little red blip, blip, blip about that frequency because it's battery operated, it will uh, not. You don't want it just constantly going. Um, and when we leave here, I'm going to use one of these detectors on the little badge thing outside, just out of curiosity to see what it is. Um, so we're going to go and we're going to put this tag that came with the device, and we're going to set it on top of the frax mark. And then you can't see that a whole lot. That's what I'm doing. And then we're going to run this. Uh, I'm just showing it. Oh yeah, you're just showing. Go ahead. I'm just holding it steady in front of the camera. I'm paying that much attention. I don't know how much you can see. Gee, that's all right. It's one of these uh, things in the mirror. We can push it in that here, <laughs> right? That okay, so we'll go. We'll go LF search um, because we don't know what it is, other than we know it's low frequency at this point. 
Oh, we found an EM forty one O X ID tag. Okay, great. And look, there's there's the ID right there. So then we're going to go ahead and we're going to. Uh, oh no, didn't mean to click. Let's go back. LFEM forty one O X reader. LFEM forty one O X reader. No, nope, not recovery. Forgot you can't always tap. So it's reading it. If I take the thing off and I run the reader command again, it, it doesn't read it. Because remember, readers once, watch is multiple. So if I go to watch, now until I can wave it in front of it and you see it appears, I can take it away and it stops. And uh, then I can just hit enter or I can unplug the prop spark or do whatever and it won't be there anymore. So now I want to take this, this little hex code. And I'm going to use that to clone the card. Now, something with this device, this cheap safe, does not like to actually work with the card, even though the card seems to take it fine. I'm assuming it's just a very, very slight impedance mismatch with the antennas. It's not quite getting coupled. Um, so unless it does something different tonight that I haven't been able to get it to work, at home, uh, that's poor English, but whatever, then this part will not actually work, but that's okay, because I'll show you another cool thing you can do. So I'm gonna find one of my random blank fobs that I found online that has a T5577 chip in it. I'm gonna drop it on there. Actually, let me copy this whole segment here so you can see first that that tag is blank. If I can do that, I don't know if I can do that. No, we'll just clone it, who cares? Oof. And to verify, we'll go back to the reader command and it verifies. Um, you can also like it. So if we say 6A, let's go 6B. No, that was 6B, let's go 6A. So for example, now you can see a reader. So you can see it's, it's, it's working. It's actually cloning the thing. Um, so now let's hold that in front of our safe and nothing happens as expected, but that's not the end of the world. We've got this fancy little thing called the spoof command, which is not in my history, so I have to type it apparently. That's how it works. Ooh, there's a formatting issue there with the PowerPoint. I'll fix that later. I'm not going to go for that right now. And it would help if I type correctly. LF. So what this does is it waits until it sees a tag. And I'm just going to use the one that I clumped that has the right thing on it. And it's like, OK, great. We captured your tag. Now go ahead and hold the proxmark up to your device. So now I put the proxmark LF antenna over the device. And if it works like it did at home, it'll pop the thing. And apparently it's not going to do that for us tonight. Well, just for kicks and giggles. Let's use the tag that came with it instead of the one that I cloned, because there may be some small data difference that I am just not aware of. No, nope, it is not going. So, could be any number of things. It has worked before, not with this specific prox mark, but the other one that I have. Uh, but I was able to get the I was able to get the safe pop with the. Uh, the prox marker. I assume, like I said, that's part of why I assume it's an antenna issue. I'm assuming this puts out just enough RF juice that it's able to pop it when it wants to. But yeah, it ain't having it tonight. So, uh, all right, we'll consider that part of the demo will fail. Um, let's carry on and see what else I, I spun up. Wigan stuff. It's Wigan, Wigan, Wigan. 26 bit. Um, if anyone wants to offer up a valid dookie for me to test this with, great. We'll publish it on national, international so actually, yeah. Zoom. I'm not going to use uh, any of the stuff that I use for anything I use it for. Uh, but I do have one that should be pre-programmed with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, and oh, I'm not sure where that's at. So I'm going to program one real quick with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm going to do this a little bit in reverse. So I've got these fancy dual frequency cards here, along with some other cards that I don't know exactly what they do, but they came with Proxmark. 
Well, here's an HID that uh, shouldn't, if it is activated anymore, it's your own darn fault because I haven't actually uh, had access to where it unlocks for a couple of years. I've just never bothered taking it off. My... All right. So here we go. Let's find out what this key is. And this looks to me like it's just going to be a standard. Oh, I didn't mean to close out the presentation. Hello. Idiot mode. All right. So let's uh, hold this over the antenna. And let's do an LF HID search. No, just an LF search. All right? It would help if I typed an F instead of an S. Hey, look at that, a valid HID prox card. And we do have a facility code and a card number in one of the more common uh, 26 HID bit formats. So there are a few different ways that we can clone this, right? So let's take one of our one of our blank dual frequency cards that are just like completely blank on both sides, right about the same thickness as a typical credit card. Put it over the antenna from the same command. Uh, this has a valid EM ID on it. That is interesting. I do not know why that's there. I guess the manufacturer programmed something in. Well, guess what? Let's wipe it. Uh, we do not need that. So let's go here and we are just going to take this little string here. You don't even need the whole thing. You could. I'm just going to take that much of it. We're going to do LF HID clone R for raw and paste the raw hex in and poof. And now if we do an LF, uh, LF search, it should show the exact same thing that we saw when we took Andy's fob there. So if Andy wants to, and if that card is active for something, he can now use this blank card here and go up to whatever doors that one lets him in, just like he had his little fob here. Um, and if you have the card in your possession, you've got the parts mark set up and all that, that's about as easy as it is. You can even have this, you know, logging somewhere. It supports various like operate from battery and do it in script mode. Again, haven't been able to find documentation on it, but even if you have this just in a laptop, you know, plug it into a laptop in a backpack and kind of, you know, carefully wedged in there and go around and just have it in watch mode. Um, and you you know, you know can just have it log in and capture some cards. And sometimes if it's not a great read, you might see an artifact. I can't get it to fail right now. Interesting, that's what you get for doing live demos. It works when you don't want it to and doesn't work when you do. Um, but yeah, so there's that. And then if we do an LFHID watch and I can intersperse the, the white card versus Andy's card. And you can see that they are just, it doesn't see a difference in them. So to the, the door controller, if you were using this with the door controller, these would be exactly the same thing. Um, and let's see what else I might have here. Um, oh, let's, let's do, let's turn this card now, now that we've done that, let's turn this card into a, uh, my demo card, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So if we go HID clone, one of the nice things about this, similar to some utilities, if you just hit enter, it's like, uh, you're an idiot. Here are all the stuff you can do. Ah, thanks, all right. And they put the most useful stuff at the bottom. So you don't have to scroll back and try to find it, which I think is a really nice touch. So we're gonna go W and then H10301, facility code. Now remember, facility code is one byte of data. So I can go 255, but I can't go 256. So 123 is an acceptable value. Card number is two uh, bytes of data. So I could go 65535, but I can't go any higher than that. So I'm just gonna go four, five, six, seven, eight. And we don't want the Q5 variant. We don't want the EM variant. So I'm just gonna say that's what I want. And it would help if I did not put the dash in front of the H1 or whatever, like it shows in the screenshot. And there we go. So now if I LFHID reader to verify, just like it says, oops, I've now got the, uh, the thing there. Now, this raw, I got it to compute one time. I don't remember exactly how it does it. I think it includes the parity bits. It's thrown me off a few times. But basically, if you just strictly want it, clone a card, you just grab the raw data and paste it in and there you go. Copy paste, you know, using your terminal, keyboard shortcuts, whatever you do. If you want to 
you know, generate cards that do special things, I would recommend using their uh, solidity code and card number. There are also utilities built into this Iceman version of the Proxmark stuff where you can, there's actually like a Wigan calculator built in where you can have it just generate the hex for the various stuff if you throw in a facility code and a card number. Um, so yeah, there's that. Let's see what else I had. Uh, detector, yeah, for the people that are here, I'll show you the diagnostic cards on the detector and the way out the door. Let's see if I can get uh, them to show up at all on camera right now. This could be a little interesting. I might need some help holding some stuff. We want to hold here if we want to turn off screen sharing. Yeah, Thank let's you turn off screen sharing. So what I'm going to do for those of you that are watching on there is this is uh, one of the detector cards, and I am going to issue a command uh, that's uh, basically the uh, HF search. It's, it'll search for stuff in the high frequency band. Uh, something to note about these proxmarks is the little red antenna that would right now be on the bottom. Uh, yeah, second six being recorded, that's fine. Um, you, that's your low frequency. And then the one that's built into the PCB up top and from the side view, you can see it's a three layer PCB, but the third layer is only on the low frequency antenna. The top part is the high frequency antenna. So now I'm going to position my dangerous things card on the high frequency antenna. And run an HF search, and we should see it blink. Is it blinking? There it there is. There it is. The red LED is blinking. And then if I go low frequency and do the same thing, I should be able to see. Now, in the Proxmark terminal here, I am seeing it complain about, you know, no, no card found. Well, that's because this is strictly a coil of wire. You can kind of see it, maybe. So strictly a coil of wire that um, is wired to some LEDs with, I believe, it's a capacitor or some, some component to multiply the voltage a little bit so it's high enough for the LED. And no, this is not detecting. Yeah, this has some low frequency issues. Let's pull out the other detector card. And we'll try this one on low frequency if I can hold it in such a manner that you can see the LEDs. Is that LED visible? Yep. OK, sweet. And it's a green one, right? Or is it red? It was blinking red. It's red. OK, yeah, that's right. So another little gotcha is the this. So both of the detectors use red for low frequency, if I remember right. But one of them uses green for high frequency, and the other one uses white for high frequency, which is a little interesting. Actually, maybe the dangerous things is backwards. I don't remember. Maybe it uses red for the high frequency. Regardless, when you, the, the dangerous things use green and red. This one uses red and white. As you can see, low frequency is red and the high frequency is white. So if I do a high frequency search, then you'll see it blinkity blink blink. And there we go. And it doesn't find anything because there's nothing to find. Do um, you want to flip me back to my screen uh, share? Yeah, you just have to click uh, share screen again on your. Oh, I need to share screen again. OK. Um, do, 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 do. It's a new thing. Yeah, I have the ability to pull you off of screen share. Yeah, just works. okay. Um, this is maybe it says I'm sharing. There, there we go. go. This is what I talked about earlier. Um, don't buy these, please, unless you're willing to break cards. I even broke a card that was supposedly not editable with one of these things. And then I brought it back because apparently it actually had a T55 chip in it. Um, it was one that I bought from a commercial retailer of these things. So who knows? Anyhow, um, as we talked about, we, you can often recover it, but not always. It's especially bad if you do this to a tag that you've implanted in yourself and now you maybe just bricked it. Um, happens due to bad magnetic or inductive coupling. Um, they have these special antennas if you're going to use implants uh, that work with the fancy version of the Proxmark. If you're going to go the implant route, go to dangerous things, look at all their stuff, do what they tell you. Um, the reason why it can break them is that part of what you can program on T55 chips, T55 whatever chips, is how it communicates with the outside world. So if you incorrectly write a part of the memory that tells it how to read data from the antenna, you can see how that could be a permanent brick in that case without potentially 
opening up the card if you can figure out how to do that without destroying things and then directly connecting to the leads on the chip to rewrite it. Like, no, it's just bricked. It's permanently bricked. If it's implanted inside you, that's really, really bad. So don't use these guys. Just, just don't. Um, next, there we go. Um, defenses. Uh, one of the requests was, you know, okay, well, great. And all this stuff is scary and whatnot, but how can you defend against it? So I have a few, I've done some testing and I have some materials for those that want to see, but I got some copper baking sheet stuff. Says it's copper. I don't believe it is. I'll go right through this. Got some, you know, standard, wonderful, high grade, cheapest available aluminum foil. I'm pretty sure I actually got that from Dollar Tree. Uh, <laughs> uh, it will stop some of the RFID, but not others. Um, I also made a couple things that I thought were, were fun. I believe that's in this case. I've got so many little cases out here. So these are six layers of that aluminum foil and then laminated. This will stop everything I've tested so far from being read by the Proxmark. A commercial reader with more power might be able to punch through it. Don't know, haven't tested it yet. Um, but as far as perhaps Mark being able to read it, even if it's just literally sitting on top, I cannot read through this. So I think six layers of aluminum foil is pretty good. Also, a couple things I got from Amazon are these little aluminum sleeves. Um, these both block high frequency stuff. So your credit cards, for example, uh, I cannot get them to block the low frequency stuff with just the layer. And these don't slip into each other real nicely. So like if I sandwich it, like if I, you know, use it not as intended to just sandwich either side, the two layers of it seem to be good enough to block the low frequency stuff with the front part, but not, not on its own. Then you got these guys. These are the real fun ones. So these allegedly emit a jamming signal that will prevent the thing from being read. And from my testing, I kind of believe them because even if I have this resting on the opposite side of the antenna coil on the Proxmark, it still prevents the high frequency stuff from being read. So yeah, it does not seem to do anything for the low frequency stuff other than provide a little bit of a barrier. So most of the defenses out there that are commercially available that I have found for reasonable prices on Amazon only apply to the high frequency stuff. So if you're looking to protect door access and it doesn't use high frequency, don't buy the commercial stuff. It's probably a waste of money. Um, and now we're just going to try a few of those for the fun of it. And if anyone wants me to try any of their RFID blocking devices, mm -hmm. let's go for it. I'll, pro I'll provide a tag if you don't want to use your tag, but let's see what we got. Any questions from anyone so far? Silence, that means you're either muted or you don't have questions. Although, I don't have any questions. <laughs> I put something on this one, right? We lost one. Uh, Polly. Well, hopefully they'll be back. Yeah, so there's there's low frequency. You said you'd You'd be surprised if he popped in because he thought he'd fall asleep before even before the meeting started. Well, it happened. So I wonder if he just fell asleep and decided, well, it's being recorded. So I'll just. Yeah. And uh, before people pop off here, uh, we, after Jared's done, we were going to hold an election uh, quick to. Uh, so please think about if you want to run for office. Yeah, first. We probably should have. <laughs> we we can push it off till next month if people would rather. Okay, so if you're watching the screen on Zoom, you can see where basically the low frequency just reads through this little aluminum sheet regardless. But it it blocked it blocked the high frequency when the tag was actually in the high frequency. But this tag does show up if it's over the antenna without the uh, thing around it. And then I'm going to do the uh, one of my which call it's one of my custom 
high quality six layers of aluminum foil and trying to read the low frequency tag again. Also, when you're testing this stuff, make sure you put it over the correct antenna. I've been like, oh, that's awesome. It blocked it. Oh, no, that was over the wrong antenna. Um, so, yeah, oh, look at this. Look at this. The Proxmark actually detects that the signal looks like noise. So it is seeing something through those six layers, but it has also not been able to make out what that something is. Yeah, LFHAD reader has nothing. Um, and then here is with the blocker card underneath it. LFHAD reader. And notice it just goes right through, it doesn't care. Here is with the blocker card on top of the card to be read. So if it were a passive block, this would not work at all, really. Um, but let's do an HF search. And we'll see that I believe it just doesn't, doesn't show up at all. Yeah, couldn't, couldn't find How it. How on earth is that doing a quote active block without any power? Because it's harnessing the power from the high frequency. That's how all of these, that's, that's how these transmit data is they get their right. power, they get enough power from the- I just didn't think it would do that. And that's it up like, I was highly skeptical myself, but like I say, in my testing for the high frequency stuff, it seems to do what it says on the temp. Like I can't complain about it. This will definitely not be being returned because it does what it says. And I, I, I'm not one of those people that just return stuff, you know, on a, on a borrow policy. Here, I have one to try. Uh, this is a, uh, if you look inside, there's like a, a thin metal mesh. Yeah. So yeah. The, this wallet claims to be. And you don't have any credit cards. There's nothing there. uh, yeah. else in there. Okay, let's see what HF search gives us. HF search. Which I got it for not finding it for the fact that it's a uh, thin form uh, wallet, not because it's uh, magical. Right. So it is blocking my Proxmark high frequency. Let's check low frequency. This is this is the harder test. Ah, read it right through. So if you have a door card, if you have your door card that we demoed here, let's try that since we don't care about that. I'm assuming that it will read right through, but it is a smaller antenna, so it may be a little bit harder. Oh, that's another thing that I came across that was really interesting. So they make these long range readers, but at wide long range, they mean like a few feet. They're used for like gate control systems. They're also like $600 a piece, which is why I did not buy one for this demo. <laughs> um, oh yeah, poof, right through there. Yeah, uh, dread. Um, so, but it would be good enough to buy a credit card. RFID. Yep, yeah, yep, absolutely. Yeah. And if anyone that's yeah, really that's wants to know what it's designed for, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, and the Amazon product descriptions are not super thorough in terms of specifying that stuff. They say that it blocks RFID and credit cards and keeps you safe and this, that, and the other. And while well, saying it blocks RFID, I mean, yes and no. What type of art? You know, you have to get more specific. It's like saying that, you know, something blocks radio waves. Well, just about every material blocks a certain frequency of radio wave. Like, come on, you know, what are we talking gamma rays or are we talking, you know, or sorry, not radio waves. Uh, it blocks electromagnetic frequencies. Like, okay, but what frequencies? Are we talking, you know, ultra terahertz or are we talking like hertz? You know, so. Or light. Yeah, exactly. So um, here's here's the last slide for those that want it that are still here. Uh, QR code is just same thing as that link there. Uh, this is a short link that'll go to the Google Drive presentation. Should be publicly viewable. I'm pretty sure I tested it. Um, we'll also email it out or uh, Slack it out or IRC it out or whatever, yeah. et cetera. Um, but yeah, that's really all that I have, unless anyone has any questions or wants to put them around more or test more stuff or well, take home some. Yeah, yeah I do, before people leave, we do have a little bit of business here. Uh, either we can push it off till next month or we can uh, just rip the bandaid off now. Uh, one of the things uh, to take care of here was the, uh, uh, if people are willing to run for office, 
I, I'm willing to accept nominations. Uh, basically, the, the thought was three, basically president, vice president, secretary, just for lack of names. Think of it as number one, number two, and number three. If one isn't there, two takes over, and three is the ultimate backup. I'll be a two or a three, I'll run for something. I, I'm willing to uh, stay as uh, the, the president, uh, but uh, de definitely again to to protect against the bus factor, some uh, extra protection is definitely needed. Uh, but not going with anything overly uh, formal. But if uh, uh, we we only have three people and they're they're willing to agree to be which one they want to be, uh, we we can do it by just uh, unanimous consent if there aren't any objections. So I, I've heard uh, Jared's willing to be something. Anyone else? Do you want to hold on to your secretary position? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm going to stop sharing our screen. Yeah. Yeah, stop yeah, here, we'll stop recording here just to, and I'll trim the end of that off.